thank Dean Trent, Professor Bonifar, Professor Chabon for uh, having me here at Montgomery College. I appreciate it. But more importantly, I want to thank you, the students. Because by you guys showing up here today, you're actually communicating something to all of us. They're communicating it to me, to your peers, to your professors, that you care. That you guys care about your education, you care about wanting to learn more, you care about your career development, and you're showing up. And showing up is a big part of communication. That's what we're here to talk about today. So I want to thank you all for that. And it encourages, encourages us and inspires us the panelists, your professors, to get up every morning and teach you guys, knowing that you guys are showing up and willing to learn and care. So thank you guys for being here. It's important to remember that. Now, as I was uh, thinking about what to talk to you all about today when I got asked to do this, I started thinking about all the various speakers and symposiums I've been to throughout my career and my, my educational process. And one in particular stood out. I was a sophomore in college at VMI. Virginia Military Institute, I was 19 years old, and they brought in a speaker, a motivational speaker is how they sold it to us, to talk to us about leadership and try to motivate us. So this guy gets up there and he starts talking, but it wasn't necessarily what he said, it was how he was saying it that first caught our attention. And he gets up there and he starts a speech for the first 30 to 45 seconds in the most boring monotone voice you can imagine. Just gets up there, thank you guys very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm really excited to speak to you guys about motivation and about leadership today. And he goes on for like 30, 45 seconds. And we're all thinking, are you kidding me? They really talked to this guy to come and talk to us about motivation and, and you know, get us fired up? And then about 45 seconds or so, and he pauses. And he goes, psych! I'm just kidding, y'all. You thought I was going to give this speech that way the entire time, didn't you? And he woke us up, and he grasped our attention, and we, we were hooked. And I remember walking out of there absolutely inspired and motivated. And the reason was because his boisterous personality, he believed in his own story, and that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. And it came out in the way he talked to us. You guys can take plenty of classes about how to give a speech, how to give a presentation. I'm sure some of you have already taken those kinds of classes, and that's not what I'm going to try to talk to you about today. What I want to try to talk to you guys about today is it's how you say something. It's about your tone, about civility, about respect. Because that's, that's a big part of what I do as, as a prosecutor, as a trial lawyer. And your tone can determine perception and believability in a courtroom. And if you're not believable, you're not credible. And if you're not credible, you're going to have a tough, tough time in life, regardless of what career path you choose. Now, many people think a prosecutor's job is just to simply convict people of crimes and get a conviction rate. And I'm here to tell you that that's not, that's not what I do. My job is to present truth and to pursue justice. And it sounds cliche, but it's absolutely what I do. And I have a lot of discretion in how I choose to do that. But a lot of what I do is not just what I say. It's how I say it. It's how I'm interacting with the various parts of our legal and justice system. Because let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a day and age where words matter. They carry a lot, a lot of weight these days. And the way you say something can be interpreted a million different ways. And that's perhaps some of the most important, some of the most important parts of how you communicate, is how you say it and why you say it and why, what motivates you to say it. So when people sometimes ask me what I do for a living, I tell them I'm a storyteller. But I tell real stories. I tell people stories in the courtroom every day. And when you think about it, you know, you think about TV or law and order, there's the prosecutor, there's the defense attorney, you're telling the case or the, the, the case facts and the theory to a judge or a jury. It's that simple, and what, it, what it, they kind of try to make it seem like. But it's much more complicated than that. And the reason for that, and what I want to tell you a little bit about my, my experience is, I have to communicate every day with not just a judge or a jury and a defense attorney. Every day I'm dealing with police, I'm having various communications and talks with police about their cases, with the sheriff's deputies in the courtroom, managing what inmates we may or may not have in the back, maintaining order in the court, with the courtroom clerks who have all the case files that are necessary for that day or that docket, um, with various witnesses uh, and witness vict uh, victims advocates that come there and talk to us, 
It's many moving parts. And how I communicate with all of them on an everyday basis determines and can impact how any certain case, um, can, you know, how the result of any certain case. And I said earlier that communication is kind of at the heart of, uh, of storytelling and what I do. But what's at the heart of communication? The key element that I want to kind of submit to you as an argument is it's conversation. So many of us get lost um, in the art of, excuse me, we don't understand the art of conversation anymore. It gets lost in text messages, in emails. There's not a lot of face-to-face. -face. But that's part of what I, I'm a, I'm a people person, that's why I, I do what I do for a living, because I want to be talking to people face-to-face -face every day, and that's what I do. Um, but conversation matters. I want to give you two quick examples uh, from my experience that'll kind of get you thinking a little bit about tone and about civility and about respect and why it's so important. Um, first story, I had a case, it was a drug case with one defense attorney, and Virginia has a law where if you get caught with a certain type of drug, uh, you can do some community service, take a drug awareness class, and in about a year, if you're on good behavior, it'll get dismissed. Uh, defense attorneys ask for that disposition all the time, and it, the judges usually give it to them. So I remember having the conversation with defense attorney, and I said that I wouldn't object to that kind of a disposition. And I used the words, no objection, that's what I said, that's what I wrote on my notes. So she emails me back the next day, and she asks, uh, hey, just for my records, would you mind kind of responding to this email confirming that you'd agree to recommend that disposition? And I responded, no, because that's not what I said. I said that I wouldn't object to it, not that I would recommend it. They were trying to change my words around. And so I, I said it very politely, responded, no, I'm sorry, that's not what I said. I said it, no objection. That's what I, no, I double-checked my notes. And that could have been the end of it, but it wasn't. Kind of spiraled out into a plethora of emails where the first one I got back was, that's not what you said. Now you're changing your story. Now you're changing your offer. That's not what I told my client. Now I've got to go and see if he even wants to do this. Frankly, if you had just told me that yesterday, we would have had a hearing. I wouldn't have even agreed to it. In a very nasty tone, for no reason. It wasn't necessary. Second story, and I'll get back to it in a second. A different defense attorney, but a similar kind of a drug case. And the issue there was um, the Miranda warnings and whether they were read properly and whether the defendant uh, invoked them and decided not to talk to police. Well, there was a video for this case. And the defense attorney pulled me aside. I, I've had a rapport with both of these defense attorneys. This second one pulled me aside and goes, hey, man, listen. Um, you watch the video in this case. You know, the cop reads the Miranda. The guy says he doesn't, doesn't want to talk. And the very next thing, the cop asks him a question, and he, he kind of gives an incriminating response. I think there's kind of an issue there. Uh, you know, can we try to work this case out? You know, please, you know, check it out. Very respectful, very down to earth. He didn't come at me with, your case is crap. You're going to lose. Let's just go to trial. Drop this case right now. Came to me, you know, as a professional. So I trusted him, I verified, I went and watched the video 10 minutes real quick, and he was correct. And we were able to work that case out. No big deal whatsoever. Now, if that first defense attorney had emailed me back and said something along the lines of, hey, maybe there was some kind of miscommunication, uh, you know, in the way we talked yesterday, it was kind of a busy day, my notes are a little different, um, you know, would you be willing to try to recommend it as opposed to the no objection? Uh, you know, I, I really appreciate it. I don't know what, where that communication got lost. I would have been more than happy to have been like, okay, no problem. But it was the way they approached it that made the difference. And it's just two very slight examples that have happened in the last six months, actually, um, which is why I use those examples. But it's important because conversation like those, that's what leads to building and maintaining professional and personal relationships in any aspect, whatever your major is. I know I look around this room, and I, I'm inspired by the diversity. And I, I've spoken with your professors about many of you. I know some of you are first generation. Uh, and come from all over the world, and I'm inspired by that, and I love that you're here learning about this. Um, and remember, though, conversation, and what I want you to take away is that it's not about listening to respond. It's about listening to understand. Listening to understand, not listening to respond. And so when you're having conversation, listen to the other person. Learn what they're trying to communicate to you and what you're trying to communicate back to them. You always want to try to have the goal of leaving any kind of a conversation feeling engaged, 
feeling inspired. Because any conversation can actually lead to an argument. Or you can leave feeling engaged and inspired. Now, why am I telling you this? It kind of relates to my last points that I want to, want to talk to you all about. Some of the best advice I've ever gotten in my life was, you know, to approach every day as your true, authentic self. And you hear that all the time. Be yourself, just be yourself. What does that mean? Well, I tell you all this stuff because none of this matters. None of the stuff about conversation and tone and civility and respect matters if you can't be yourself. If you're not presenting it to the world as your true, authentic self. So, my story, I'm first generation American, first generation college student, first generation lawyer in my family. My parents come from the Middle East, and that's a big part of my identity and who I am and where I'm going. And I want to tell you a quick story that relates to being yourself. I was lucky enough to uh, have a federal clerkship. And as part of that process, a lot of attorneys that do that end up going to big law firm jobs and whatnot. That's not where I'm at right now. Um, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be, and I'll tell you why. I had several dozen different interviews, and informational interviews, uh, informal and formal, with various law firms during that year that I was clerking. And the conversation was kind of the same. I knew that I wanted to be in court. I knew that I wanted to try to be entrepreneurial and pursue business. That's kind of my background and my personality. And so I would have those kind of conversations with these law firm partners uh, and various associates, getting an idea of what their firms were like. And I'm not afraid to tell you all, I didn't get any offers during that year. And at the time, you know, I was upset about it. You, you kind of live and learn. But I landed exactly where I'm supposed to be because of it. Because I was actually myself during those talks, during those interviews, during those conversations. I would tell them that's what I wanted. And that's who I was, and I wasn't going to change that just to fit the model of whatever they were trying to sell. They were looking for associates that were going to sit in a cubicle all day and you know, draft motions and briefs and read case law all day. And that wasn't going to be me. And that's not what I wanted. If there wasn't the right place for that, well, then we, you know, you move on to the next opportunity. Um, and that goes back to what I, a phrase I said earlier. Believing in your own story. I look around this room and there are people from all races and backgrounds and religions. Uh, and I want to encourage you all to believe in your own story. Because when you believe in your own story, it gives you the power, the power to communicate it to the world in, in the way that works for you. Whether you're telling your story at an interview to try to get a job, whether you're telling your story on a date to how to get to know someone, you know, or whether you're at a business pitch or a business idea. How many of you ever watched the show uh, Shark Tank? You guys watch that show? I see a lot of hands. One of my favorite shows. A quick example from there. How many times have you ever seen on that show where the people pitching the idea don't necessarily have the best product or the best business model, but the investor goes, I like you. I like your drive. I like your hustle. I believe in you, and I believe you're going to make this successful. The product needs work. The packaging needs work. The business model needs a little tweaking. But I'm going to make you an offer because I believe in you. Why do those people get those offers? and those investments. It's because they've learned how to communicate their own story and be, and be their true authentic self no matter what the costs. They were willing to go in there knowing that they may not have the best idea or the best product, but that they were part of that product and that their story and how and where and why they got there was going to launch them to that next level. And so I want to encourage you all. That's something I want to leave you with today as I close up here is to believe in your own story. Learn how to communicate it your way to the world. And you'll land exactly, exactly where you're supposed to be. I want to thank you all for letting me speak to you all today. Uh, I just want to let you know I'm being into mentorship. So if any of you guys want to reach out to me, I have my business cards. I'll be here. Come talk to me. If any of you are interested in law, come talk to me. I actually answer my own cell phone. I answer my own emails. Uh, so feel free to reach out. Thank you all very much. This question is going to everyone, and we are going to start with uh, Melissa. Briefly tell us what your career entails and your journey to this point. 
when it comes to communication skills. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Malisa Amaro. I am currently the Director of Operations for Hertz, Dollar, and Thrifty in Northern Maryland area. So on a day-to-day, -day, I oversee um, about 24 locations. I have 24 managers and six interns that report directly to me. I oversee everything from planning, budgeting, managing, training, interviewing, um, the next wave of management um, managers coming into our organization. And what was the second part of that? So um, my position calls for me to communicate with senior management on the executive level, as well as frontline employees, as well as managers that directly um, report to me. And as you guys know, in today's day and age, there's different ways of communicating with people, whether it's by email, meetings, um, in person, and for some of my employees, text message. So being able to decide when and how to use forms of different forms of communication is essential in my role because not every way, uh, not everyone is going to communicate the same and receive information the same way. Thank you. Thank you. Ray. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ray Gilmer. I'm the vice president of communications for Montgomery College. I work here at MC. Uh, our department handles, uh, well, for example, you see the, the TV crew here, the MC TV uh, channel is under our department. We ha happen to also handle marketing for the college, advertising, digital signage, those uh, signs you see on the gateways and the entrances coming into the campus, uh, social media, uh, public relations, as well as internal communications. So the college is a big organization with lots of faculty and staff and, of course, students and uh, reaching out and making sure that people stay as connected as possible while we're all busy doing what we have to do every day is a, is a tough challenge. Uh, the, you know, this, in my career, I've done a lot of things, and so applying all of those acquired experiences and things I've learned from other people that I've had the pleasure to work with is what I try to bring to the job at MC every day. Uh, you know, communicating is a two-way street. Just because you're saying something doesn't mean you're communicating to the person who's supposed to be listening, and then hopefully you're going to have some give and take back and forth. Uh, engaging with busy people, I think, is our biggest challenge in any, in any kind of communications project for us here at MC. We want to attract people, make sure that our community knows that MC has a great, is a great resource and is a great place to come learn. Uh, but we also have to keep in touch with you once you're already here and uh, make sure that we stay engaged with you and that you have the information that you need as students to successfully complete your, your goals and move on to your next steps in your career. Thank you, thank you, Ray. Let's go to Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Proctor Rogers. I am an attorney and a life coach. For 20 years, I was an entertainment attorney in the business and legal affairs department at BET Networks and Viacom, the global media company. Um, I negotiated music deals, talent deals, everything that you see on the networks, I negotiated to make sure that we had the tools to have everything on the, the network. Um, communication is the heart of media and uh, the heartbeat of what an attorney does, whether it is through writing, through communicating with um, other attorneys, negotiating deals, um, how you communicate is so important. It's not just what you say, but how you say it. Um, and there are different techniques of communicating because what you, how you communicate when you're in front of someone is very different from how you communi communicate over email or presenting a, a memo of some sort. I have a lot of experience in working with clients who are trying to develop themselves and transition into other careers uh, as a life coach. And so most of that communication is, is verbal with that client. And it is very important for them to feel nurtured and also motivated uh, and to listen deeply to what it is that they really want uh, in their careers or in their life so that I can help them figure out what their next step is. 
Thank you, Michelle. Ashley. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashley Buster, and I am an actor. I guess the, um, the more broad umbrella would be performer, because under acting, I also sing and I dance. Um, I do mostly musical theater. I'm currently in a production of The Wiz at Ford's Theater, right down the road in DC. Check it out if you would like to. Um, I also, um, as Rami mentioned earlier, am a storyteller. So my entire job is communication. And not only while I'm on the job am I communicating, in order to get the job, communication is very important. And not just the things that I say, but the way I carry myself. Um, we just saw a skit on interviews here. As an actor or a performer, your life is interviews, except we call ours auditions. You're going into a room and you're constantly having to communicate to people with what you say, with what you sing, with the way you look, with the way you stand, with the way you carry yourself, why they should choose you for their production, whether it be singing on a cruise ship or performing a play or being in a movie or being in a TV show or in a commercial. You're constantly showing people what you have to offer them and why you are that person to pick. Um, I'm not sure how much you guys know about the profession of acting, but there's a lot of us out here trying to make it. And not everybody is going to end up being, you know, Viola Davis or Denzel. There's too many of us out there, but everyone wants to get there. And a lot of the reasons that those people get to where they are is because they're able to communicate more than just verbally that they are an asset to whatever production it is that they are trying to be a part of. So in terms of communication, I think um, being aware that it goes beyond what you say is something to really, really be mindful of because that's something that I think is missed a lot of the time. So everything that you do, everything that you present is a communicator. And I think that is very important to remember when you're meeting people, when you're interviewing, and just when you're out and about, that everything you do is communicating something to someone. And on that note, I think self-awareness of what it is that you are communicating and how you are perceived is something to also be very aware of. Because in my profession, it plays a very large role. Thank you, Ashley. Tom? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Williams, Thomas Williams. I'm probably the uh, elder uh, on this panel member. Uh, so what I guess I've learned over the years is based on about 40 years of practice, practicing law. I'm an immigration attorney. I've been doing that for about 30 years. The, the immigration practice is a, is a federal practice, which means that the typical scenario that you think of when you watch television with, with the attorney sitting behind the desk and talking to the client, that's not what happens in, in my situation. I'm on the phone constantly. So although I'm located in Virginia, I can handle cases in California or Florida or wherever. But it's always... 99% is, uh, uh, is by, um, phone, by telephone or Skype. So the communications that I'm involved with, um, I have to understand I don't see the person face to face. I've got to kind of get a feel for what level of knowledge they have um, so I can ask some basic questions from them. Some of the people who call me probably know the law, the legal parts, as well as I do because these are graduate students, undergraduates, faculty members, uh, and they've done a lot of research before they've called me. And they've talked to a lot of other attorneys before they've called me. Uh, some people are, are just called and say, I know nothing about this. So what I have to do is basically tell the same story over and over again. Um, but I have to do it at such a level that I can use the terminology and expressions and phrasing so that they will understand what I'm trying to say and what the, the most important points are for them to take away uh, at whatever level they are. Um, you know, I had mentioned like get, telling stories. I know when I represent a case, what I'm doing is not so much um, the citations of law, again, as you might think. When you go through law school, they say, oh, you, have, you do the, the re case research, you write up uh, summaries of what each case stands for. You write the citations properly. Well, that's all fine, but the people who are reading whatever I'm writing, I don't know what level of education they have. We do not meet face-to-face. -face. I cannot 
even call them uh, on the phone. So what, again, I have to do is kind of guess at what level of knowledge uh, and skills and background they have and write accordingly. So I don't necessarily tell stories, but I do something really close, and that is give kind of common examples. The law they kind of ignore, I've learned. <laughs> they will read the citation, either not understand it or just kind of ignore it. Um, but if I give them an example, then they will be more appreciative uh, and they will acknowledge what my point is that I'm trying to get across. So again, my, my communications are by telephone, uh, written communications that I send to the government, uh, and things like that. And that's, that's what I perceive as, as the type of uh, practice that I do. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Tom. April, please. My name is April Turner, and uh, my long story short is I'm originally from Clearwater, Florida, and I always knew that I loved media and communications and government. And like, what better place to be than D.C.? So that's where I came, and I went to Howard University and majored in communications. And throughout that experience, I was able to intern on Capitol Hill, which afterwards turned into a career. Um, I started out answering phones and doing mail, but I asked the communications director, can I assist you? Can I write press releases? Which landed me a job after college, being communi a, a communications director on the Hill. I was there seven years. I loved it. I worked with Nancy Pelosi. It was great. And then I was also going to grad school at George Washington University, getting my master's degree in political communications. And I decided um, to be a full, well-rounded communication professional. I tried my hand at New York, the, you know, the biggest media market there is. And I moved there to work for a PR firm for five years, which I realized that I didn't love. Um, I got to do corporate PR, which is different than doing government, you know, um, communications. But um, throughout that journey, I found that I really wanted to work for nonprofits. So I moved back to D.C., where I work now, the Campaign for Youth Justice. I'm their communications director, and I also have my own business, Turner Communication, which I, my motto is PR with a purpose. So I love working with nonprofit clients and um, really had to go through the government um, experience as well as the corporate experience to realize that I love nonprofit communications. And I think my advice would be that there's so many different types of things to communicate about. You really should find, follow your heart and pick your passion because communication really is everything. I spend my days now talking mostly to reporters. I, um, the Campaign for Youth Justice works to stop the incarceration of youth with adults in the criminal justice system. So uh, media is very, very important to us in our work and, our, and being advocates. So talking to media, getting press for my organization and my clients is really where communication comes into play for me every day, talking to different reporters, making sure that I'm getting good press for my organization. Thank you, April. Most of you have answered question number two, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and then we'll start with Melissa again. This one says, what does effective communication mean to you and how is it manifested at work? You might just specifically tell us about any calm skills that you use. Um, so for a lot of you guys, um, in a couple of years or now, you guys are going to be going out and interviewing for positions. So majority um, of my day, I actually spend interviewing um, prospective managers. And that skit that we saw here, guys, it wasn't, it was spot on. Um, two things that I would take away from that is, one is really know yourself. Um, Rami spoke about it. When you're in an interview and you want to communicate whether it's your skills, your passion, or what you're going to bring to an organization, when we're sitting on this side of the table, we can feel if you're being genuine. We can feel if you're passionate about it. And honestly, you want to be matched with the right employer. You don't want to be that cookie cutter um, interviewee. So really, um, I urge you guys to really do your research, to really kind of hone in on your skills. And don't be afraid to let them know that you are different and what you can bring to um, uh, their organization or a team. Um, and the second piece, too, is in my job, uh, I'm required to communicate with multiple um, people on different levels. And the one thing that I see is that sometimes we think that communicating in the same way is effective for everyone. Um, we need to be mindful of when you choose to email, when something is important enough to set a meeting or to do it in person, um, and just simple things as like following up. Um, we see that a lot. You may have a conversation, you may have deadlines, you may have things that are required from you, um, but you're not following up with 
that person. That's also different forms of um, communicating. So I urge you guys, again, to be yourself and to know your audience and to do your research before having those conversations or interactions with people. Thank you. Melissa, Ray? That's great advice. I'll echo that. Um, let me take a different, let me add to that and take a different tack on what I think a lot of companies and organizations, nonprofit, for profit, corporate, would want, and that's delivering results, adding value. We talked about that during the skit. That was part of the message of how, how do you demonstrate that you can bring value to that organization. And uh, these days, especially with digital marketing, uh, you've been hearing a lot about Facebook in the news lately and, you know, privacy issues. Well, it's all about data. It's everybody's data. Well, there's good parts of that, and that data can be used to track how effective your communication is in many cases. Now, of course, this, you know, a face-to-face -face conversation, that's not about data. It's about relationships. It's about understanding. But there's a lot of communications these days that are in the world of, of you know, the corporate world or even for you know, nonprofits where they want to know how to use new technologies to reach certain audiences and how do we know that those audiences are understanding and getting and maybe even acting on what we're asking them to do. A lot of communications is to try to elicit a behavior, a change of mindset, to instill an understanding. You know, is it, is it to make a purchase or is it to go to an event or is it to seek more information? Uh, is it political? And all of, that, all of that communication is for trying to advance an organization's agenda, you know, their goals. And if you can show how you understand the modern technologies, data, tracking, understanding, you know, how, many, how many impressions did I make? Did I reach women? Did I reach single mothers? Did I reach veterans? Did I reach underserved populations? Did I reach people that they have the ability to buy a Lexus? You know, all of those different objectives, no matter who you're working for, understanding how you can use modern technology, use data to deliver results and demonstrate the value of what you bring, your spirit, your creativity, your ingenuity, your strategy. It's all great to talk about, but if you can say, you know, and I increased outreach by 22% among women, or I increased sales by 12% in the first quarter, that is something that means that you're moving the needle for that organization and will give you a, a leg up, I think, on interviews. Thank you, Ray. Michelle? In my line of work, communicating starts for me with listening to what my clients and the other departments really want, um, understanding what they really want. And then because as an attorney, I am servicing the other departments, I have to deliver what it is usually um, sometimes it's about they want to know what risks they can take if they want to put on a certain type of content. And it may be something that we, we need to get the rights for. They want to understand that. I have a legal degree. I know the law. I know about copyright infringement. But a lot of the people that I'm dealing with are creative people and business people who don't have a law degree. So understanding how to talk to them and to really get to the point and come from what it is that they want to know um, as opposed to my own agenda or how I communicate with other attorneys is very important. Um, I think that, again, everything that the people on the panel have said so far about communicating in an interview is very important. How do you help the company or the organization achieve their goals? That's what needs to be communicated. But you don't know that until you really listen, you research, and really try to understand what they need from you. And um, then you communicate through uh, email, phone conversations, face-to-face, uh, -face, what it is that you can deliver. Thank you, Michelle. Ashley? Can you give me that question one more time? Lost sight of it, just a and smidge. You, yeah. Ashley, and, and you think I remember the question? <laughs> what does effective communication mean to you, and how is it manifested at work? Absolutely. What is it manifested at work? Yes. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and quickly reiterate a lot of what's being said as far as research and knowing where you're going and knowing who you're presenting yourself to and knowing who you're talking to, who you're communicating with. Um, specifically in my line of work, I'll go in for an audition for something. If someone calls me in for a certain show, 
smart thing to do would be to research that show, find out what characters they are that I might be good for, find out who the people are going to be behind the table. There's nothing worse than showing up at an audition and the entire creative team is there. And they're like, oh, hey, Ashley, how are you, Ashley? I've seen you done yada, 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 yada. And you're looking at them like, because you don't know who they are. You don't even know what theater you're at sometimes. It's that much. I think being aware of who you're talking to does a lot in terms of communication. Um, as far as talking, as far as sending those emails, whether or not you want to email them. Um, just keeping in line that we're talking to a lot of millennials right now, guys. Social media is a big communicator. Please be aware of those things. Because in my line of work, you also have a lot of casting directors and theater associates and producers that will go find you on Instagram and on Snapchat. And I don't think you guys use Facebook or anything anymore. But they will make judgments because you are communicating something by the things that you share, by the pictures you post. You know what I mean? By the articles that it says that you've read or whatever the case is. Um, be mindful of those things in terms of communicating in your professional world. I know for actors, lately a lot of the times in auditions, people have been asking how many followers you have on Instagram. Networking is a huge thing. And that's all about communicating. I also say um, build up your small talk skills. Learn how to just, you know, kind of schmooze a bit. Because um, in terms of getting a job, people definitely want to hire someone who is great for the job. But something that was also mentioned is people want to hire people and be around people who they like, who they enjoy. There have been plenty of times where the most talented person did not get the gig because maybe nobody knew who they were because they didn't talk to anybody anywhere. Maybe they weren't the most likable person, you know? Maybe they didn't come in there and be a genuine person and show who they really are and what they could offer personally to that production company or to that theater company or to the job or whatever it is. So that's my two cents. Thank you, Ashley. Tom? Uh, as far as communications, for me, communications is everything because I normally don't have a coat and tie on. I sit behind a computer. So I'm in blue jeans and a t-shirt or whatever, so that's the real me. So communications, as long as you don't see me, I always promise that before I start doing videos, I'm going to lose 45 pounds and grow hair. <laughs> well, neither one has happened in 10 or more years. So I can kind of hide behind the anonymity of a computer screen, but that means that I've got to be able to talk to the person, understand the person, and again, feel, feel what level they are um, and, and empathy is a really big part of it because a lot of these people are going through stress when, when they're calling me uh, and they just need to find out what the information is. The, um, and I, I've given talks and then one of the things I, I will say, you've got to have a little bit of, of humor or com comfort level. I've, I've given talks out in California and up north and probably within a couple of minutes I always want to use the word, I'm from Virginia originally, so I want to use the plural of the singular you. But in Massachusetts, they're not going to understand what y'all means. So, and that's kind of a way of, even though they're not from the United States, because it's international students, uh, that kind of breaks the ice a little bit. So if you can be relaxed, if you feel confident, you know what you want going in when you're, when you're talking to people, uh, then you're going to have a good idea of what's relevant for you and if it's not a good fit, it's just not a good fit, and you can't really force it. So when you go out and you graduate from school, look at the areas that are of interest to you, because I think it will be more of a natural fit, and you'll feel more comfortable. So will the interviewer, and so will your, your co-workers. Uh, the general rule is, you know, everybody's a salesman. Doesn't matter what you are, whether you're emptying the trash, whether you're the CEO of the company, you're always a salesman. So definitely keep that in mind. Even people that you think may not be able to help you directly or involved in what your interests are, um, they will know people who know people who know people. So always be aware of that. Always present the, the best information in your, your best um, uh, materials forward. And, and, and I think that'll benefit you uh, as you interact with people. Thank you, Tom. April. I agree with everything that was said by my colleagues. I would just add, when I think about an effective communicator, it's a person that never stops learning. Um, uh, uh, communications, well, I'm biased, but I feel it's one of the most smartest people at the table. And that means that you never stop learning 
you know, when I started my career on Capitol Hill, there was no Twitter or Facebook. If you told me then that I would spend most of my day doing that medium to communicate, I would have thought you were crazy. So to think about that you have to keep self-teaching yourself and learning new things. Right now, I'm working on a project with Google. We're doing a virtual reality experience for, to, to understand what it is to be in solitary confinement for people that have never experienced it. That's interesting to me that that falls at the communication person's seat. They work with Google to do VR. Um, so just to think about, it's not enough. Um, I do agree social media is very important, digital communications, but to understand how to use them strategically to be a well-read person. Probably before I go into the office, I've watched no less than three news programs and read about six papers. I know everybody's waiting for me to let them know what's going on in the world that, that day. So I just think remember to be constantly learning, constantly thinking, constantly taking in information so you can use it to communicate about is important. Thank you, thank you, April. Through our text message, I have been instructed to, <laughs> for time limit, but uh, I have uh, one question for Ashley and Melissa. I mean, Melissa, sorry. One question for Ray and Tom, and then one question for April and Michelle. If you can tell us under one minute, this is for Ashley and Melissa, what observations have you made about the importance of positive behavior and attitude in your field? I think it's one thing. Um, for most people in, in my position is, we can teach you the skill. If, if you come and work for me, if there's something that um, I need you to learn, I can teach you. But what I can't teach is the will, how you carry yourself, your attitude, how you treat people, um, if you take initiative or not. And Ashley touched upon this. People want people to work for them. People want to be able to relate to, um, relate to people on their team. Um, in my position, I probably spend more time at work with my coworkers and employees than I do with my family. So having that uh, sense of family is built, and that's built on how we carry ourselves. Um, being able to take feedback or constructive criticism and apply it into our work. You know. I know I take notice the guy, my, my employee, that comes in early every day and, and checks the equipment and slips me a little post-it under my door. You know, I take note for that manager that stays later um, to make sure that that employee that gets off at 11 has someone to walk with them to their car. Um, I take note of people taking that initiative without being told. So, and then lastly, um, I work in an industry that's constantly changing. So there's always new direction from our, up, our higher ups that we need to cascade down to our people. I can't bring those messages down to my employees if I don't fully believe in it and I practice what I'm preaching. They're not going to follow me. They're not going to bring that down to their employees. So I have to model that behavior and that, you know, that is part of um, those positive uh, interactions at work. Thank you, Melissa. Ashley? Um, I found that in my line of work, positive behavior and positive attitudes, um, whether it be me looking to cast somebody or work with someone or me trying to get a job working with somebody, is that it keeps you employed. Nobody wants to be around somebody who is unpleasant. It doesn't matter. Um, for me, I, I look at talent base. You could be the most amazingly talented person in the world. If you're not easy to, to work with, you're not a pleasant person to be around. You don't want to learn. You don't want to be directed. You don't want to try to soak things up. Nobody wants to be around you, you know what I mean? Um, and that positive attitude and that positive behavior, you have to realize, we also mentioned up here that somebody might know somebody who might know somebody who might know somebody else. And in my realm of work, that world is really small. You think that you can, you know, be in a production in DC and you act up and you diva out and then you go to New York and think you're going to get cast on Broadway. Absolutely not because that director is best friends with the director of Broadway. You know what I mean? Um, so I think it's really important to remember that, yeah, everybody knows everybody and everybody likes nice people and positive people and pleasant people and people who are willing to learn. It doesn't matter how smart you are how talented you are, wherever you think you're coming from, all of your accolades, there's always room to grow and learn. And that's something that I've definitely learned in my line of work because as a performer, 
there's a lot of opportunity for you to humble yourself. And you will be humbled. So I think to come in there with that in mind, knowing that you know you are good at what you do or whatever the case is, but there's still space to learn. And to be an easy person to be around, it's going to keep you employed. And it's going to keep you employed in a very nice and happy and positive working environment, no matter what field you decide to be in. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ashley. Ray and Tom, Ray, this, you go first. Can you give us just one example of an ethical issue that you have experienced at work and how you dealt with it? A delicate issue? Ethical. Ethical. Uh, yes. Tom, why don't you take that one first, <laughs> since you're the lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think we had ethics, do we? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, lawyers are, they have to be ethical. I, you know, again, despite what you see on television sometimes, um, lawyers really uh, protect the law. So it's not only that you're representing your client, but you really do have an obligation to the, the they say you're an officer of the court. But that means that you have an obligation to the legal system. So it's not necessarily the individual uh, that's the, the, the primary concern, but in my opinion, it's the legal system itself. So as far as the, the ethics are concerned, I, that's very important to me. I've had clients that say, well, you know, I can get you documents. And I say, I know you can get me, you do, me documents. I've been around for many years. I don't want those kind of documents. Give me the truth, and then we, I can work around most anything you want or the, the, your situation is and what your, what your goals are. So as far as the ethics are concerned, they are primary. And, you know, talking about once you have your reputation out there, you may think it's a small community, you're only, you're only talking to one person, but if you get a bad reputation and, and your ethics are brought into question, it's, it's going to spread and, and you're going to lose clients, you're going to do harm to your clients, and that really does not benefit anybody, and the legal system itself can be hurt. So definitely abide by the ethics. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Um, and, and our side here working at MC, we manage uh, social media accounts, and we monitor social media accounts, and people will uh, you know, include us on messages or use hashtags that we've established. And sometimes people use social media to vent if they're angry or frustrated or just want to take it out on somebody, and that's probably not the best way to do it, and sometimes it's, it's not fair to other people that might be involved. And so um, we have to be mindful of the best way to communicate and try to defuse or de-escalate uh, heightened emotions, let's say, when people choose to air them on a social media platform. And for us, that's an ethical question of at, at what point do we uh, interject ourselves to try to calm this person down or connect them with the right solution? You know, did someone have a dispute about a grade they got? Did they not get the financial aid they wanted? Uh, are they just angry at a member of the faculty or of another student? Um, you know, those are the things that we wish we didn't have to deal with, but human nature being what it is, uh, you know, people have emotions and they get angry and, and the phone is in your pocket and, uh, you know, the people use, to use that tool to try to get their message across to a lot of people. So we, we try to use uh, a, a good sort of guidepost in our minds of what, what would be the right thing to do to make sure that this person, whether they've done something right or wrong in terms of using social media, how can we get them the help they need so that it's not an issue anymore and that any damage that might be done is, is minimized or, or, or stopped altogether? Uh, that's not something we have to do every day, thankfully, but every now and then it comes up and we have to make an ethical judgment about what is the proper, what is the proper voice, what is this person's right to speak their mind, and at what point do we kind of uh, get involved and help, help them find the solution they're looking for in a way that uh, doesn't cause any, any damage or hurt anybody. Thank you, Ray. I see Dr. Rai was taking notes. <laughs> this last question is for April and Michelle. Can you identify one communication skill that is needed in obtaining a career in your field? Michelle? Oh, go ahead. One communication skill that's the most important in obtaining a job in your field or career in your field. One. One. <laughs> Again, I would have to say listening. Listening for understanding. That's <laughs> good. That's a cue. 
Thank you, Michelle. April? And I agree with Michelle on listening, but I'm going to say one that I uh, see as a weakness in a lot of the young people that we're hiring is writing. Um, I think it's very important, um, and it's very important to keep building it. I think the more you read, the better you write. So I would just say writing is something I think needs to be sharper. Thank you.